Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Mary Owen, a faculty member from the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth campus, and director of the Center of American Indian and Minority Health at the University of Minnesota. I'm also a family physician for the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and I'm your host for this evening's program tonight, this evening's program, COVID-19 Update. The success of this program is very dependent on you, the viewer, so please call in your questions or email them and uh, to ask us at wdse.org. Ask at wdse.org. The telephone numbers can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening inc include Dr. J. Dave Bhupal, an internal medicine and critical care specialist at Essentia Health, and Dr. Andrew Thompson. He's an infectious disease specialist with St. Luke's Infectious Disease Associates. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Barrett Bukovic of War Road, Minnesota, Abby Rader of Glencoe, Minnesota, and Megan Serator from Bemidji, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on COVID-19 Update. Welcome, both of you. I think this evening, before I jump into a couple of questions that we got ahead of time, I'd like to ask if you have any, I mean, this is such an important topic that's been on our minds for two years now. So would you like to share any thoughts on it and your work, Dr. Bhupal, first? Yeah, I think I'd like to start by saying it's been a very long two years for everyone. I think uh, the, uh, the ICUs in our community uh, are at capacity. Uh, we are uh, at a place where we are waitlisting patients, even from ho outlying hospitals that don't normally keep that level of care. So I think it's important. This is not just about our COVID numbers. It's about our ability to, ability to care for patients in our community that may have a heart attack or may have a car accident. So I think it's important that we reiterate that this is about being able to keep our community safe and being able to uh, ensure we care for our, uh, our, our, our fellow uh, citizens. Thank you for that. So just to clarify, what you're saying is that patients are in critical care and outlying, are outlying rural communities and they should be transferred here normally, but they can't be because our ICUs are so full yes. with COVID. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Dr. Thompson, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think one thing somewhat related to what Dr. Bhupal said was uh, regarding vaccination. And I keep getting the question of, uh, well, if vaccines work so well, why is this still here? Um, and what we're seeing I at St. Luke's, and I'm, I'm sure you're seeing the same thing at Essentia, is the majority of people hospitalized and people in ICUs are those who are not fully vaccinated. and uh, I think expecting vaccines to be perfect and prevent all infection is unrealistic. What we expect them to do is prevent severe disease and prevent hospitalization. Uh, we would love to turn this from a, a critical illness into a cold or a, a relatively mild illness. And that's what vaccines do. Um, so even though people may get sick after vaccination, they're not as sick as they otherwise would have been. Thank you for that. When you say make it into a cold or flu with the vaccines, if we get to a place where the vaccines work well enough, do you imagine that um, there will be less of the long-term effects of COVID? And I know that this is just a, you know, it's an, we don't know this yet with the science. But. Right, that's one concern with COVID is um, once you recover, do you have lingering symptoms? Mm -hmm. And we know there's a syndrome called long COVID. Mm -hmm. And it appears that, uh, and it would make sense if you have a less severe infection uh, due to vaccination or due to some underlying immunity that you would have less risk of having long COVID. It's a little early to, for me to speculate, but uh, uh, it looks like there is less of that when people have been vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, I can speak to that. I, in our ICUs, without getting into exact numbers, the vast majority of our patients are unvaccinated. Um, and this is not something that is only affecting old people. We are unfortunately seeing patients in their 30s and 40s that are intubated, which is to say on life support, on full mechanical support. And it has been very, very um, sad to see the amount of loss that we've seen. Um, so I, I second Dr. Thompson that vaccination absolutely reduces your chance of being critically ill from this illness. Is there a possibility of breakthrough? Yes, but I think that it, it is your best chance, I think, uh, in preventing critical illness. And it's not 
the, the hard part is it's not even getting through just the critical illness. There are several things that happen to your body when you are in, on mechanical support and life support. And usually one day on a, on a ventilator equates one week of rehab. And unfortunately, if you do get critically ill because of the nature of the virus, we are seeing people on the ventilator for at least two to three weeks. So it's several months of rehabilitation, being out of work and being away from your family. So it's something that I absolutely second. I think prevention at this point is far superior to, core, uh, to cure. That's such a good point about the impact of having, um, having been on the uh, vent and how long the recovery is. And I don't think people think about that end. We think about before. So thank you for that. Thank you both. So Dr. Thompson, do you anticipate that the flu season will be worse or better with COVID circulating? <laughs> it's, a, it's hard to speculate uh, on w without COVID how flu might act in any given year. And we never know. Uh, sometimes we look to the Southern Hemisphere to give us a prediction of what things might look like. Uh, but so far this year, um, especially in the past few weeks, we've seen a big uptick in flu activity. People are coming into our hospital with influenza. The people in the community are getting influenza. Um, and so in addition to COVID, I have uh, additional concern. Um, this, uh, this puts a, an additional strain on hospitals in the wintertime um, on top of all, an already overburdened hospital. So um, uh, do all the things uh, that we're doing for COVID, you know, wash your hands and wear your mask and, and take care around others. And um, do those people with the flu, does the, does the flu seem stronger this year at all? Have you no, ha noticed um, that at all? It's hard to say. Yeah. It appears that there, right now there's an influenza A um, that's predominant. Mm -hmm. um, people are getting sick. We, um, we have we had multiple people hospitalized with it. So, Did you notice more or less last year with more people wearing masks more regularly last year? There was virtually no influenza last year. Thank you. There was so much uh, care given to distancing, isolating, mm -hmm. masking. There was almost no flu. It was incredible. What it would be like if we just did that for our flu <laughs> season, huh? It's hard to live that way. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Dr. Bhupal, what are the best things to do to keep me and my family safe from COVID-19? I think, um, like we touched upon earlier, from a critical illness perspective, your best chance is getting the vaccine. We are seeing some waning immunity um, beyond six months, so get your booster. I think, in addition, just general, we're seeing, obviously, uh, people that are in not, in not, People that are generally not in good health are higher risk for critical illness. Uh, obesity is a risk factor, diabetes is a risk factor. So getting your chronic health conditions taken care of um, and taking care of yourself uh, from that perspective is important. Uh, but from a COVID perspective, I think the most important thing is vaccination. And if you're high risk, take additional precautions, wear a mask, avoid large crowds, um, and uh, if you do get sick uh, and you are high risk, reach out early because there are therapies that are offered to high risk individuals uh, that include monoclonal antibodies, that include the newer medicine, uh, Paxlovid, which is, are both now coming into availability in our region. The monoclonal antibody has been around. We're switching to a different one with the Omicron variant and the Paxlovid is coming in. So if you are high risk, and by high risk I mean if you are uh, obese, if you have diabetes, if you're immunocompromised or on immunosuppressive medications, reach out to your primary care physician early so that you can, we can determine if you are eligible for these, these therapies that can potentially reduce your chance of becoming critically ill. Now, just hearing that list, uh, I can imagine a lot of people are thinking, am I obese? Do I have these things? Do I have that? So can they, should they call their providers and, and ask the question specifically there? Can they get that information there? Yes, I think uh, by, by body mass index, I believe it's greater than 30, definitely greater than 35, but that, that is something that we can, uh, they can ask their primary care provider exactly. about the, exactly what is the requirements. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Thompson, what's the recommended time frame between uh, getting booster shots? And I notice, in addition to that, I notice that the time frame has changed a little bit with time according to the CDC. Why is that? Um, I think the, the why is we're, we're learning more about um, how, how your antibody levels wane over time. Mm 
Um, and I would say that based on the interval you should pay attention to. It's currently five months. Uh, it just changed. Um, after completing your, your first series, you can get a booster uh, five months later. Um, but stay tuned because we're learning more and more about this. And uh, uh, that's, it's possible the interval may change. Um, and, and it's possible by next year there'll be a different program. Any thoughts that the interval might get shorter or longer? Any, what, I mean, you're reading the literature as yeah. it comes out. Um, and again, it also depends on how, whether there are new variants. Um, are there new variants that mm -hmm. um, perhaps our current vaccine doesn't work against? Or do we come up with a new vaccine that works better against certain variants? Um, I, would, I would not expect the interval to get shorter. Um, perhaps there, there will be a better vaccine and the interval can be longer. Um, Okay. So this is an area of active uh, research and change, I think. Thank you. Dr. Bhupal, does the COVID booster protect against the Omicron variant? I think at this point, uh, yes. Um, vaccination is protecting against critical illness uh, in, in patients that are being seen uh, in our hospitals. Is, uh, Dr. Thompson, is there a specific study or research that supports, this is a good question, I think, because a lot of people are asking it. Uh, specific study or research that supports that vaccination lessens COVID severity, or is this speculation? It definitely reduces severity. Um, and there are many studies which show that vaccination reduces severity of illness. Uh, it reduces the chance that you will spread your infection to another person if you do get sick. Um, I, so I think that is one of the most well-established findings from our vaccine studies. And every vaccine study that has been approved shows this, it's overwhelmingly effective against uh, uh, illness and especially severe illness. Thank you, so not just one study, but many studies. Many studies and um, well done studies. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bhupal, if you get sick with one COVID variant, can you get sick with the same variant again? I think that we are not seeing that, uh, we're not seeing that people, I have not seen patients get reinfected. So I think that when there is a fair amount of evidence that natural immunity will protect you from subsequent um, infections for some length of time. Um, so we are not seeing, I have not seen patients get critically ill and get subsequently critically ill from the same illness. Thank you. And Dr. Thompson, how long do you need to wait to get your COVID-19 booster shot after getting breakthrough COVID? Yeah. Uh, you. There's no reason you can't get a booster shot, mm -hmm. um, but after having a breakthrough infection, uh, your immune system has, has seen that, that variant, that, that COVID, and so uh, you probably have some protection for a matter of a month uh, to three months, uh, but I would recommend getting that booster sometime in that time frame, maybe a month or so later. Okay, thank you. And someone asked uh, if I got my booster, a few weeks ago I got my booster shot, will I have to wait another boost for another booster? Will I have to get another booster in six months? Kind of getting to what you were yeah. saying earlier that we don't know. Yeah. Don't know right now. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Bhupal, are there any supplements someone can take to boost their immu immune system and decrease their chances of getting COVID? No. You get COVID if you're not vaccinated. You, you get COVID if you're not vaccinated. Um, we have seen a lot of uh, people that are deciding to take things that there's no evidence for. Unfortunately, in the information age, there's a lot of information out there um, with regards to a lot of therapies that simply don't work. Um, and I think it's the effort and time that they've taken to research those therapies um, that don't work and they've ended up critically ill despite those therapies, I think the vaccination is going to give you much more protection, at least from a critical care perspective. Absolutely, I can see unequivocally um, at Accenture where a large group of physicians uh, that specialize in ICU medicine, and we have at any given time, I'd see on ventilators, several patients. And like I've said before, all of us unequal, unequivocally think that and know that you are well protected if you are vaccinated. It's not to say you can't get critically ill, but I think that there was a recent release from the American Medical Association that says your chance of critical illness is 10 to 14 times higher 
if you are unvaccinated. And that is what we are seeing on the ground, and that is absolutely what we are seeing in our hospitals. And regarding that supplement question, um, a lot of repurposed medicines and drugs and supplements have been studied. And there's been no benefit found to taking a lot of them. You know, we were desperate initially. We tried all kinds of repurposed medications um, and other antivirals uh, for, from other disease, you know, to use to treat other diseases, and they haven't been shown to help. Um, and so it's not as if this hasn't been studied. If we had an answer, if we had a great prevention apart from vaccination, uh, we'd be happy to have it. Thank you for that. I think that both of you have emphasized how um, important it is that in this time, and particularly in this time, to be listening to the doc our doctors who are following the science. You know, it's, we don't have time for otherwise. So thank you both for that. Um, from w another question is, what has it been like, and Dr. Bhupal, I'll, I'll turn this to you. What has it been like for physicians and nurses knowing that the majority of the patients they are caring for in the ICU are vac unvaccinated? What's that? What's that doing to morale? How's that take looking like? I think something that's been talked about nationally is compassion fatigue, where we feel like people are dying from something that could have well have been prevented. So it's been heartbreaking. It's been very sad to see the loss. At the same time, we're physicians, we're, we're nurses, we're respiratory therapists, and we are called to, to do what we do. So. I don't think it affects the way we deliver care to our patients. I think we care for everyone the same, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. But I think that when we see wave after wave after wave and the numbers go up and up and up, you ask yourself, why is there such a mistrust um, with the medical community? And I think one of the things that has been hard to answer that question about the aspect of delivery of care is, Prior to this, I don't believe that I was questioned or my, my group's expertise was questioned as much as it is now. We get a lot of questions about, about fringe treatments that there's no evidence for. And my answer is often, if we believe that it would help, we would do it. But we have to follow the science. We have to follow evidence-based medicine. We can't just prescribe something because, we, because someone said so on the internet. Um, and I think that's been the toughest aspect of our care because in that time that we spend explaining that to families, sometimes these conversations can take 30 to 45 minutes a, a day. Um, it's the time taken away from me caring from other critically ill patients. So I think that that's been the thing that's most challenging. And that's exactly what I've heard from my colleagues over and over and over again. Dr. Thompson, anything to add? Um, I, I would agree with what Dr. Pupal said. So someone asks, it seems that all we talk about now is Omicron <laughs> variant. What happened to Delta? Uh, Dr. Thompson, well, you take it. Delta is still with us. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a, num a number of the people we have hospitalized right now um, have been there for weeks and, and got sick uh, late in 2021 when Delta was predominant. Um, but really, it has been overtaken by uh, the Omicron variant, which is much more contagious um, probably milder overall than Delta. But because it's, because it's so contagious and so widespread, it is reaching corners of our community that, that weren't infected before. And so with more people infected, uh, right now our hospitalization numbers in Minnesota, which had been kind of declining at the end of the year, are starting to increase again. How long do you think we're in for this increase? Uh, based on how contagious this is and how quickly this is going to move through our community and our state, um, I, would, I would expect in the next few weeks for this uh, current surge to, to peak and then probably decline. Um, beyond that, I don't like to try and predict the future. Given that, given that we have uh, a few weeks of Omicron, Dr. Bhupal, should people be masking in public spaces? Absolutely. I think we need to mask. We need to, we understand that people are tired of this. People want to get back to living their lives. They want to, uh, in the, you know, in the manner that they always have. We want to be behind this as well. But absolutely, I think masking protects. I think 
if nothing else, even like Dr. Thompson said last year, we had virtually no flu. And in an overburdened health system, I think any prevention of respiratory illness that in addition to what we already have will go a long way in uh, supporting a very tired uh, healthcare community that's sort of been at, 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 our, at our maximum, <clears throat> giving our maximum for the last over 20 months now. And not just our health community, but our education community, everybody who's feeling the impact of this right now. Yes, absolutely. A lot of, a lot of different industries. Uh, Dr. Thompson, following the COVID vaccine, if you get symptoms, are you contagious? Uh, so symptoms right after vaccination are probably side effects. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the COVID vaccine has pretty significant side effects. I, from personal experience, I can tell you that the side effects the day after are, are significant. Um, but if you become infected after being vaccinated, yes, you're contagious. Um, the, the duration of contagiousness and probably the amount of contagiousness is reduced from what it otherwise would have been, but you still have to consider yourself contagious and isolate until you're better. So if you get symptoms several weeks after you've been vaccinated, then you should be tested before getting around yes. a lot of other people again and potentially infecting them. Yep. Okay. You should get tested and you should isolate until you know the results of those tests. Okay, thanks. Yep. And the general isolation by the CDC is at least five days now. At least five days. Right, thanks. It's a little confusing. but it, <laughs> To say the least. Dr. Bhupal, is it safe to use steroid-containing inhalers like Advair in the midst of the COVID pandemic? Will the inhaler lower my immune system? I think they're thinking that steroid. Yeah, no, I think that whatever chronic therapy that you are on uh, should be continued. Um, I don't know that we have any evidence that it increases the risk of COVID infection. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, what's your opinion on the reliability of at-home COVID tests? Yeah, so the at-home antigen tests are pretty good. Um, but sometimes people will have onset of infection. Um, they haven't yet reached their kind of peak of, of virus load in, in, their, in their nose. And so if they take an early antigen test, they might get a negative. But with that increasing virus in their nose, the next day or the day after that might be when their test would turn positive. And so sometimes the best use of those tests is to take more than one. If you have ongoing symptoms, to take one a day apart. Um, now, with the cost of them, that isn't always easy for everyone, uh, but they're pretty good. They're not perfect. No test is perfect. Okay, for critical care, can a CPAP take the place of a ventilator to treat COVID? Initially, in the early phases, yes. Um, it is a form of non-invasive ventilation. And, but eventually, people, when they are sick enough, some people may get by with a CPAP if they're not terribly hypoxemic, if their lung injury has not progressed. So the CPAP is what we do use initially to see if we can avoid invasive mechanical ventilation because with invasive mechanical ventilation comes sedation and comes other complications from being critically ill. Uh, but I would like to look, of it, look at it as a step up. The CPAP is where we start initially, or high flow nasal cannula, which is a oxygen through the nose, but at a higher rate, 40 to 60 liters, so it gives you more support. And some people will get by on a CPAP or high flow and not end up on an invasive ventilator, but some people will not. So that's a great question, but I think that's where we start. And as the lung injury progresses, you may progress to the point where the CPAP cannot give you enough support or the high flow will not give you enough support, and then you would be placed on a ventilator. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Thompson, you and I talked about this a little bit before the show. Where can I find the exact ingredients that are in the COVID vaccine? Uh, you can look that up on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, the, the CDC and the drug, the vaccine manufacturers list all the ingredients, and they have some kind of long names because they're being very specific about it. But really what it is, is a piece of RNA that is just a small part of the, the virus, gives instructions for how to make part of the virus. And the rest of it is some salt and some sugar and some lipid. Um, and we're talking about, this is a tiny, tiny amount, a, a micro drop. Um, people have been concerned about it because it's new. Um, and you know I hear questions about, well, what's in it? How do we really know what's in it? Um, 
the ingredients are very simple. Most medications that we take have far more um, complicated structures and uh, strange molecules compared to this. Um, so you can look it up. You can read what's in it. Thank you for that. We only have about a minute left, but I do want to leave with this question, Dr. Bhupal, because I think people are asking this or something similar. I have repairs that need to be done on my home and my contractor is not vaccinated. Should I cancel? I think, I think that's a, I think you have to look at the risk and benefits of, you know, how high risk you are. Um, and again, like we've said over and over in this, that I encourage everyone uh, to, to get vaccinated because it prevents critical illness. Um, but I think you have to look at the risks and benefits of the situation, you know. I can't tell someone you should not associate with someone that's not or otherwise, but I think it's in the best interest of, um, it's the best interest of protecting yourself and your community. Anything to add, Dr. Thompson? And do other things to reduce your risk, you know, improve the ventilation. It's hard to crack a window, especially today. But, uh, you know, if you're in a situation where someone isn't vaccinated, there are other things, masking, improving, improving the ventilation uh, to, to make your environment safer if you don't have a choice there. Thank you. So I want to thank, good, uh, thank you for being here tonight for Doctors on Call with Dr. Thompson and Dr. Bhupal. Thank you both for this inf information. Next week, join us again for Doctors on Call, where I believe we will be talking about lower, uh, l lower extremity injuries or lower extremity diseases. And that's just off the top of my head. If I'm wrong, check on TV. Thank you very much and good evening.